You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Buff here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where missions to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. And our guest for this week's show is a residential assisted living investment expert, Jason Brenzizer. To date, Jason has been involved in a wide array of real estate related endeavors, including residential ground up developments in Austin, Texas, several single family rental homes, note investing via his self directed IRA, commercial real estate syndications, and his latest venture, and the one that we're going to dive into today residential assisted living facilities. Now, I'll tell you that it's, it's been uh, quite some time, a couple of years since we had an expert on the show uh, that specializes in this space, which is, again, assisted living facilities. And so I'm incredibly excited to, to dive into the really the, the nitty gritty and kind of peel back the onion a little bit on Jason's business and, and really get uh, some exposure to it and also learn from him why he's made the shift and why he's putting a lot of his focus today into this niche. But before we do, just want to go through a couple laundry list items with you guys. Uh, first and foremost, uh, which I'm sure most of you are aware if you've been listening to the show for some time. If this is the first time, then you are not aware. But um, my business, just like Jason invests in uh, lots of different types of real estate, but he likes assisted living. Um, we are in the mobile home park space. And I tell you this because we are looking for additional mobile home parks to purchase. We had a good run in 2017 and uh, are looking to make 2018 even bigger and better. So we're open to joint venture arrangements. We're open to paying big finders fees for the right deal. So if you're out there searching for real estate, whether it's mobile home parks or apartments or assisted living facilities, and you run across an opportunity in the space that is at least 60 spaces or larger in size, and again, you're looking either for a team to help you take it down or maybe just flip it for a profit, please think of us. Okay, You can email me directly to kevin at kevinbupp.com if you have a deal that you'd like to discuss. Again, kevin at kevinbupp.com. And we have the ability to take down some big deals. So even if it's a portfolio, we'd love to talk with you about it. Okay? Next up. If you've been an avid listener, uh, just like I'd mentioned, if you, you probably know our, our niche is mobile home parks, but you've also heard me talk many times about the investment arm of our business, which is Sunrise Capital Investors. And uh, in Sunrise or through Sunrise, we own and operate mobile home parks through the eastern half of the United States. And uh, we partner with accredited investors like yourself who are seeking passive investments that yield strong returns. And I mention this because we just recently closed our very first successful Reg D 506C offering. And Unfortunately, I've had to reluctantly turn away a number of you guys who have shown interest. And uh, for that, I just I want to apologize and say that I'm sorry. But don't fret because we are currently in planning mode for fund number two. And so if you missed out on this first fund and you have an interest in partnering with us in, in, in our mobile home park fund number two, we're going to be we're going to intend on rolling out sometime uh, Q1, end of Q1, beginning of Q2, 2018. And uh, so I, I suggest to go to our website, sunrisecapitalinvestors.com, and just create a free account inside our investment portal, okay? This will basically place you on the first to know list when this second fund rolls out. That way you don't miss out on it. And based on the demand that we had for that first fund, um, we're expecting to fulfill our subscriptions very quickly. So just go create a free account. It doesn't take much time. And then you'll be on our first to know list when that next fund is ready to roll out, okay, guys? And lastly, if you happen to be in the Tampa Bay area, I'm in Clearwater. I'm about a half an hour from the Tampa airport. So if you got some extra time uh, during your visit here and you'd like to grab coffee, uh, lunch, or whatever you might have time for, just shoot me an email, kevin at kevinbup.com, and let's see if our schedules uh, can, can work with one another and we can coordinate a time to get together. And I just love meeting others that share a passion for the real estate investing business. And it doesn't matter if you're in mobile home parks or not. It doesn't really matter what your niche is or if, if you haven't even bought a property yet. We'd love the opportunity to meet with you and speak with you in person. So again, kevin at kevinbup.com, and we'll try to work something out. And so guys, without further ado, I'd like to Welcome, Jason, to the show. Jason, how are you doing today? I am doing great. I'm so excited to be here. I, I'm really happy you asked me to be on the show. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into this because this is a topic that, um, as I'd mentioned to you uh, before we started recording here, that I have a, a little bit of experience with. Not a lot, not, not really working experience, but there was a point in time, Jason, that 
Uh, we owned a lot of single family homes, and this is back in 2006, 2007 era. And as we all know, um, things started going downhill a little bit. The roller coaster was going down the other side of the track or down the other side of the hill. And we were trying to find ways to basically creative ways to, uh, to create additional income in our single family rental portfolio. And so we actually looked into the residential assisted living space. I went as far as becoming a licensed uh, administrator, which you have to go through uh, you know, a state exam and a bunch of classes and such. And so I know a little bit about the business. I can't say I know nearly as much as you, I'm sure. Um, and uh, it's been a number of years since I've, I've, I've looked into it. And um, also, as I mentioned there in the intro, that we had uh, Gene uh, Gorino, right? That's how you pronounce his last name. I keep, I know, that's I keep correct. Yeah. Okay, I had Gene on the show a couple years back, and I brought that up to you, and you'd mentioned that that is actually what initially piqued your interest in this space, which I thought was pretty cool. So, absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. So, if you could, Jason, just so we have a better idea who you are. I mean, I, I, I gave you a little bit of an introduction, but I didn't really go into detail, and I didn't want to, uh, you know, steal the thunder at all. And so, if you would take a few minutes, uh, tell our listeners just a little bit more about yourself, your background, and how you got into real estate. Well, I I have worn many hats over the years. It's true. Um, look, I got I got started like like most people. You know, in our society, we're taught, uh, uh, you know, get good grades, get into a good university get your degrees and go get a reasonably well-paying job that's secure. So I did that. I was a scientist and engineer at giant corporations like Motorola and Northrop Grumman. I did that for, for many years and, and it was good. Um, but you know, inside I was feeling kind of this, um, a, a tug that said, Hey, you need to be doing something different. So eventually I made a 180 degree pivot <laughs> and, uh, uh, I went into storytelling. So for me, that was that was acting and screenwriting and producing for independent film and TV. I did, um, uh, you know, character narration, uh, character voices for for video games and cartoons, and narration for for commercials and, and audio books. And you know, so I've done a lot of different things. But there was this kind of a theme that was emerging over the years where. Um, it didn't matter wh- whether I was in the corporate world or, or doing creative pursuits that, you know, if the job went away, the dollars were going to go away. Mm-hmm. And I, I know f- probably for most of your listeners, that's not a big deal, but for me, it was a huge revelation. I was never taught that, that I was trading my time for dollars. So there was only so far ahead I could get doing any of that stuff. So that, that helped me focus a bit more on, um, uh, trying to build something long term and have a have a bigger impact. So on the creative side, now all I'm doing exclusively is is writing novels and doing the audiobook production for for my own work. And I I control the intellectual property for that. Mm-hmm. That allows me to work really hard today um, and reap the benefits for years to come. And for for real estate investing, that that helped me shift my mindset from from more of a speculation type of investing mm-hmm. where you know we were doing um like like you said uh some some new builds here in here in Austin and had some issues in in the uh, the last market reset we can talk about that if you want mm-hmm. um but but shift more to uh, a buy and hold strategy where I'm looking exclusive, exclusively at cash flow. So that could mean single family homes. It could mean uh, vacation rentals, mobile home parks, like what you're up to. Mm-hmm. Um, or for us now, and I say us, it's me and my wife, um, focused almost 100% on residential assisted living. Okay. Cash flow is king, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would love to dig a little bit into, not not spend too much time on it, but your um, you know your ground up developments, because that is a completely different business model than what we're going to be speaking about today. And uh, you sp- you talk about the speculative nature of it. And, uh, and, I, and honestly, I just assumed that maybe it was um, sometime in the past uh, eight, eight to 10 years, you know, during the, the most recent cycle that we're in, not prior to the crash. But it sounds like those speculative activities, the ground up developments in Austin were actually prior to 2008. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. We started in, in 2003 with that, um, with a couple of partners, uh, one guy, a real estate agent who, who was instrumental in, in, in teaching me a little bit at the beginning. Um, uh, he was very investment minded. He got a, a big builder and an architect kind of all together in a, in a nice group. And, and we were more, uh, I would say, 
uh, passive investors. We were equity. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was kind of where we first cut our teeth on, on learning about real estate investing. And, and when it was good, it was good. Um, so those first, uh, three, uh, three or four projects that we did, we averaged 35% return on our money. And that money was in play for about 12 to 18 months. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, that, that was fantastic. But the fourth one, um, we decided to go with something a bit bigger. We found an, uh, um, an 11 acre parcel that um, hadn't hadn't uh, had any of, of the uh, electric or water or sewer done. So we had to do a kind of a two phase project on that, which was building, getting, getting the buildings plans passed by the city and, and then doing the site prep. So we got into all of that work. And we were going to phase two was to build out 15 single family homes on that on that uh, parcel. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were still in the middle of phase one. That's when the big market correction happened. Mm. And uh, that money was tied up till 2014. Wow. And yeah, no, it was crazy. Um, <laughs> it, what it did, it was like a big wake up call for me. I, I realized how much I didn't didn't know about what I was doing. I mean, I, I, I thought I'm a real estate investor <laughs> and, and uh, I was a s- speculator. Um, I mean, there's I had no control over the deal, really. I mean, yes, I was a partner, but, you know, there were a lot of other people in play on that. And um, I had only so much to say and didn't even really know that much about what we could do when the market, you know, had a tick up. Yeah. Okay. Well, it sounds like you at least made it out. Uh, you know, like you, you guys didn't end up losing that property. So you just sat idle, basically. That sounds we, like right. That development yeah. sat idle for a number of years. We exactly. We we um we had to make changes to the to the to the plan um again and again and again. The city actually at that point was instituting all kinds of um uh, new codes and regulations, mm-hmm. and so we had to because we weren't at a certain phase. We had to keep going back again and again. Oh, and the bank, this was a huge one. Um, I, I didn't know the difference between a conventional loan and a commercial loan other than kind of the terms as far as the uh, the interest rate and, and the, the length of the loan. But with a conventional loan, you're locked in. You're pretty safe. Um, with a commercial loan, they can decide, hey, we want this off the books and yeah. try very, very hard just to call the note. And so we ran into that kind of issue where we were constantly having to renegotiate with them and pay down the principal. So we were putting money into it, not just letting our our current money sit, but we were having to put more money into it to maintain it. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's, that's oh, not it, a fun situation. Not at all. That's the opposite <laughs> of uh, investing for cash flow, which is what we're talking about today. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, you could go to you can go to school and learn this. You can get yeah. mentors, or you can go to the school of hard knocks. You, you did go to school, yeah. yeah, right. The school yeah. of hard knocks. Yeah. But you know, so I, and again, I don't want to I don't want to go down this path too far. But you know, the, the the feeling that people have with regards to the the confidence in the market, um, you know, today is very similar, probably to that feeling that you had and that your group had and that everyone had in two thousand five, right before the big correction happened. And I know the correction that happened back then was for a multitude of different reasons than what it might be in the future, right? But we do know that real estate runs in cycles, and so. What has that taught you? I mean, I, I know it taught you that you don't really want to look at speculative type investments, but how has that changed your your perspective of just looking at real estate investment investing in, in general as far as, you know, uh, there's a lot of confidence out there. People feel good, right? And if people feel like you can't lose, um, has that changed your outlook? I mean, are you a little bit more pessimistic now as far as uh, just overall market conditions or, you know, where we're at in the cycle and are you more conservative as an investor overall? I, I would say uh, maybe realistic as opposed to pessimistic, but okay. definitely has changed how, how I look at it. So um, it, it's really tough in a market like Austin. I mean, it's hot. We have people yeah. moving here from all over the place. Uh, I think it's one of the fastest growing cities in the U.S. right now. And uh, so it's it's you're competing with everybody. If you're a flipper right now, you know, it's really tough to find a property because everyone's doing it again. Yep. Um, and that makes it hard for for someone who who's trying to do, you know, other type of investing in Austin as well. Um, so I, it's a it's helped me be able to do an analysis on on a market, not just from the growth standpoint or how much can I get for rent or whatever, you know, that type of thing, um, especially appreciation. Right. Um mm-hmm. And, and look at the what's behind a city, what, yeah. where I would want to invest and, and do that kind of analysis. Like, how is this going to do in a, in a recession uh, yeah. or a downturn? 
And uh, are there, is there enough industry in that town to handle that? And is that recession proof? What type of investments are recession proof? You know, you're looking at in mobile home parks and I'd say, well, that's probably one of the most recession proof uh, type of real estate investments you can do. It's, it's, um, affordable uh housing mm-hmm. um and still lets people do you know ha- kind of have the american dream i guess you know own own their own home sure um and and for us you know looking at, at uh, assisted living it, it, it the the changes that are happening right now and in, in how we have a giant elderly population and it's only growing to me that's that's something that points to being a bit more recession proof someone if someone needs help with their care um they need a solution so yeah. that uh, yeah, I've definitely gotten gotten more uh, conservative in my investing, but okay. it's it's looking at the fundamentals more, which sure. I hadn't been doing, you know, mm-hmm. early on. Yeah. Well, I, I want to talk about assisted living now. I want to switch gears and I want to focus on the topic of today, and that's assisted living. And uh, give me the give me the light bulb moment. I mean, I know you'd mentioned that you heard an interview I did a few years back, and that at least piqued your initial interest in this um, in this niche, right? And and we could say that assisted living is it's a it's equal amounts of real estate play as it is a business play, right? It's a business that just, it's kind of like a McDonald's, right? I mean, McDonald's is a fast food business that just happens to have prime real estate attached to it. And so you could, you could almost say assisted living is very similar in nature is that it's a business play with real estate attached to it. But talk to me about the light bulb moment that actually piqued that initial interest and in, in what made you start digging a little deeper into the niche. Absolutely. So, you know, when I when I first heard about it, um, the numbers made a lot of sense. Certainly, um, uh, I'm, it, it's it's interesting. So, I listened to that podcast with you and, and Gene Garino, and I thought, wow, this is really amazing. And uh, but I'm really scared of it because it's like you say, a business component sitting on top uh, of the real estate. And that's actually much harder. Now, mm-hmm. uh, it takes a while to get to the point where you open the doors, but then. Hey, you have to run a business. You're you're an entrepreneur. Um. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I'm sorry for interrupting the show, but I have something super important I wanted to share with you. I've been invited back for a second consecutive year as a presenter and panel moderator at the Best Ever Conference in Denver, hosted by Joe Fairless. Last year was an absolute blast, and the talent both on stage and in the room was nothing short of amazing. And this year, that talent has been stepped up a notch. Being that you're a listener to my show, I'd like to extend an invite for you to come and join me this year. The event is February 9th and 10th in downtown Denver, and seats are very limited. Use offer code KEVIN, my name, K-E-V-I-N, to receive 10% discount off the price of admission. The early bird registration is limited, and I guarantee that this event will sell out, so grab your tickets while you can. To learn more and to register, go to besteverconference.com. Now, I'm positive that once you take a look at the speaker lineup that your mind will be made up and you'll be attending. And just to sweeten that pot a little bit, I'm going to be hosting a free real estate and mobile home park investing mastermind on Friday evening, free of charge for all who want to join. I did the same thing last year and it was a huge hit and I'd welcome the opportunity to meet with you and spend some time together to help you reach your real estate goals. If you want to partake in this mastermind session, you'll need to send me an email to kevin at kevinbupp.com and include proof of registration as well as your contact information. That way I will put you on the mastermind list. Again, go to besteverconference.com, use offer code KEVIN to receive a 10% discount off the price of admission, and I'll look forward to meeting you in February. Now back to the show. But I was trying to compare it to the other types of investments we were doing, and uh, I quickly ran some numbers of kind of what the averages are per room in Austin um, for someone who would be staying with us, and, and looking at, well, how can I compare one residential assisted living site to single family homes, which I was doing before. And, uh, you know, the, the, the homes that we have in Dallas and Atlanta, we're looking at somewhere between 12 and 15% return. And, um, you know, that's only a, a few hundred dollars, uh, you know, in cash flow mm-hmm. uh, per door. And so I did a calculation to figure out how many single family homes would I have to have to equal <laughs> one residential assisted yeah. living. The number for me was 72. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 72 single family homes. Yeah. And I, you know, we don't have, we have enough. And I, and I thought it's kind of a set it and forget it. I have a, a property manager uh, for, for all those homes. And 
Mm, I still have to be involved in that, right? I mean, it's sure. not, you know, that there are issues that come up and, and I still have to make sure that I'm not getting fleeced uh, by someone doing work on yep. the property and all of that. Well, multiply that by 72. That's a heck of a lot of work. And, and it's all spread out all over the place. You know, if they were all in the same city, maybe a little easier, but you know, uh, I wasn't planning on doing that because I can't really buy single family rentals here in Austin. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was the big light bulb moment. Like uh, it's it's a, going to be a job no matter what. If if this is what I want, if I want something that's going to be making me income over the long term, whether I do it with a whole bunch of hundred single family homes or whatever, or I do a few assisted living places, like that was that was the choice. And I thought I can be more focused uh, with one site. Okay. And that was that was the big moment. Okay, fantastic. So talk to me about some of these statistics and the data that support why there's such a huge demand for assisted living and you know, regarding the baby boomer population. Can you speak to me about their numbers and then follow that up with how you've determined that where you're based out of in Austin can you, there's enough of demand that you can support bringing in one, two, three, five. I know you're looking to build 10 over the next you know, short period of time, a couple of years. And so um, how do you know that that, that demand is actually going to be there? Sure. Uh, if we just look at the U.S. demographics, there are, mm-hmm. there are 10,000 people uh, turning 65 a day right now mm-hmm. in the United States. Um, if you're uh, 80 and plus, 80, four, I think it's 4,000 people turning 80 every day. Wow. And the numbers are only climbing. So for the next 20 years, the peak of that's going to be 17,000 people a day turning 65. It's huge. It's huge. And we don't really have solutions for people who, who are living this long and need help. You know, the, the heart disease and, and cancer and, you know, we're getting a handle on all these other issues. And now the big issues are becoming, oh, memory issues as we get older and how do we handle that you know mom and dad can't live in their house any longer because they can't keep it up they can't go to the store they can't you know there are a lot of things that they just can't do for themselves um in austin specifically um like i said we're we're one of the fastest growing uh cities in the u.s we have 200 people moving here every day wow yeah the growth is just insane and so building is happening like mad here um you know, we're, we're turning into a, a metroplex very much like Dallas, Fort Worth and, and some other large ones around the city, uh, around the country. And uh, the, the senior numbers are actually huge, too. Uh, so we have people moving here to retire and they're moving mostly into um, retirement communities where they own their own home. And uh, eventually they're going to need help. Mm-hmm. So they're here. And they're going to need assisted living. One of the things that we've, we've looked at is is how many um, how many assisted living sites versus independent living sites for for the elderly are there. And uh, it's it's uh, you know like a maybe twenty percent ratio. So you could be moving into an independent living a giant location and eventually need help and they don't have a space for you. Hmm. So that's kind of the okay. niche that we're trying to fit into. Well, let's define, I, I, I'm going to do um, uh, some definitions here just so that the listeners know exactly what we're talking about here. So first and foremost, assisted living, um, the type of assisted living that you're building, Jason, uh, we keep saying residential assisted living. What does that mean? Because I know that uh, a lot of those that are listening, they might even have a relative or a family member that actually are in assisted living facilities today. And they might be the type that you're building or they might be the you know the big institutional type uh, assisted living facilities you know the 180 300 500 bed type facilities and so define what it is exactly that you are uh, you know the niche that you're in that you're building and in addition to that define what independent living means because that's a that's a completely different model than assisted living Sure, absolutely. Um, so residential assisted living, uh, it differs from the big commercial sites in that um, y- you actually have a much smaller site and you're still zoned residential. So essentially you are a what was or, you know, if you're doing a new build, a single family home um, that can have a certain maximum of residents to, to maintain that kind of designation. So in the state of Texas, you can have 16 up to 16 residents in, in a site and that's considered residential. If you go past that number, it's commercial and you have to jump through a whole bunch of different hoops to get there. And you might as well have, uh, t- take care of a hundred people as opposed to 17. Um, what that allows us to do is, 
cater better to the needs of the individual. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have a a better um, uh, resident to caregiver ratio. So some of these big sites, um, you know, we're trying to make a little shift in the industry here uh, in our own small way, because at the big sites, you've got uh, corporate overlords. I, you know, it's a kind of a, a tough, tough way to say that, <laughs> yeah. but right. There are, Fair there are people, there are people up in the, uh, you know, the high tower that are, that are making decisions based on numbers and they're very far removed from the actual care of the people. Uh, and, and what that does is, um, they, they're, they're tweaking their numbers to, to get good profits. And that's great. Everyone wants profit. I totally believe in it. But when you have, uh, you know, 30, um, residents to one caregiver and these people are needing help with um, getting dressed and and maybe help going to the bathroom and and making sure that they they get their medication and all of that like I don't know but I'd have a hard time k- taking care of, of 30 people with all those needs over the course of a day and, and we're more at a six to one ratio so wow uh, it, it's a it's a big difference and that's that's one thing that we're looking at to in in the residential setting um, where you can get a higher level of care you can cater to the needs because you can make individual meals for people if you if if they have specific needs that you couldn't do at one of these commercial sites um and it's also an easier shift i think you know uh, rather than going and living in this giant facility um mom and pop you know can go from their single family home in the neighborhood where they've been living for 40 years and move down the street into another home that's very much like their own mm-hmm. and and that kind of that mental that mental shift is can be a lot easier than some because those big sites can be overwhelming i think there there are some people will thrive in that situation and that's great but for those who don't this is a, a different option for them yeah very interesting you know that my grandfather who is no longer with us but there was a point in time where he really should have been in assisted living and um the only options that my parents had uh to give him at that time at least where you know where they lived uh is a large institutional type facility and he was completely against it. And, um, I mean, we, 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 they toured with him, they showed, you know, he had, he had the opportunity to meet some of the residents and I mean, toured multiple locations and just was completely against it. He would rather have stayed in his own home and, and basically lacked the care that he really needed versus going to one of those big institutional type facilities. Yeah. And, uh, the one option that was not present, or at least that maybe, maybe my parents didn't know was present was, uh, this residential concept, which would have allowed him to, you know, stay in a residential type setting, smaller setting and not move into, you know, what I think in his mind, what he perceived it as is a hospital and he hated yeah. hospitals that, you know, that, that's, that's kind of what the, the, the comparison he used was. He's like, I'm not going there. If I go there, I'm going there to die and I don't want to die yet. You know, like that's kind of how he thought about it. And, um, and I think that he would have probably thrived in a smaller type of setting. He was some of an introvert, you know, he wasn't like the social yep. butterfly type guy, which you know <laughs> probably thrive in those bigger settings. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's quite interesting. And so I want to talk to you about the ratios a little bit. You you, you'd mentioned like a 30 to one ratio, um, uh, you know, resident or, um, um, I, I guess, um, uh, residents to a caregiver in a larger facility versus like a six to one in one of your facilities. But before we talk about that, um, if you could just take a minute or two and, and define what independent living is, because uh, we, we, we mentioned that phrase. I just want to make sure everyone understands the difference between independent and assisted. Yeah, independent living would be um, if you say your mom, uh, the house is too big and, it, you know, you're trying to downsize. She would move into a place that's very much like an apartment. Independent living is is an apartment that happens to have a lot of activities um, f- for the elderly. Um, so she would be able to take care of herself. She would have a kitchen in there. She would have, you know, her own living room and bedroom and, and all of that. And uh, maybe do some of the, her own shopping still. But it's a way for her to move um, from maybe isolation in a home out in the country or something and, and be around her peers more mm-hmm. in, in a, in a setting where she still is active and can, can take care of herself probably is still driving at that point. Um, that definitely differs from assisted living and that, um, we, we call them the activities of daily living. You know, the things that you have to do to, to survive, um, are not being met, uh, maybe at your home. And so, um, 
you know, that could be, that could be cooking. That could be, uh, they say toileting, um, a, a variety of even combing your hair or whatever it is. Um, but it doesn't go, assisted living doesn't go into the nursing realm where you need specific medical attention on a daily basis. Okay. So that's kind of gives you the delineation of the steps that you would be taking from, you know, when you lived in your own home or, or apartment to moving to a place that's more focused and, and catered to your needs, but you're still active, mm -hmm. then where you need a lot more attention, maybe help with your medication, and then past that point where you've got the medical care, you'd go into skilled nursing. Got it. It's my understanding as well with independent living that um, you also might have the ability to have some a la carte services available to where as you as your needs increase, like maybe it gets to a point where you're having challenges getting into the bathtub or uh, having challenges is driving at that point that you can start paying for a la carte services maybe not all independent living but you know some is that is that correct is that an accurate statement i believe that some places do that yeah um okay. but it, yeah you're you're you know if too many of those add up you're bordering on assisted living and probably sure. would need to move to another location but you are correct i would say that um uh, the, the probably the the tipping point for that is is cost. So those a la carte, if you need just help with one thing every so often, that's not that bad. You're paying mm -hmm. for that individually. But if they keep adding up over time, you'll eventually be paying as much or more than you would be paying for assisted living. Okay, okay. I want to get back to the ratio. Uh, you'd mentioned in a larger facility, it's pretty common, mm -hmm. thirty to one ratio, thirty residents to one caregiver. Whereas in your setting, which is a you know six, I guess sixteen resident or smaller setting uh, to where we still consider residential and not um, on the commercial side, uh, it would be more like six to one, uh, six residents to one caregiver. Uh, is that is that a pretty common comparison from the residential concept to the larger commercial concept as far I, as caregivers I, to residents? Yeah, I would say that you're you're certainly getting a more favorable ratio in, in residential um, each oper operator or owner is going to be making that that choice of what that ratio is. So I, I'm probably uh, with my six to one uh, am am doing a little bit better. I think I uh, when I kind of looked at the competition, I'm seeing more eight to, uh, eight to one or ten to one okay. um, at the other residential sites. But it's still yeah. a lot better than than that thirty to one at, at, at a lot of these commercial places. Okay, sounds good. Well, I want to talk about this first deal because you guys are about to open up. You've been working uh, diligently to get your first location open up and uh I want to talk about more specifics of the not necessarily you don't not the address per se but the <laughs> uh you know like the size of the property uh, how you found it you know what what attributes existed in that property that made it a good fit for this this particular concept so can you speak a little bit to that property specifically yeah absolutely i i did an analysis um i i got the state information on on all of the assisted living places in in the three counties that that are around austin and um there were 42 of them of my type okay. in in those three counties where i was looking and so i i actually put it on a map and figured out well number one what is the area not being serviced um, that was a big one for me. I didn't want to be right next to somebody else that already had, you know, that neighborhood covered. Mm -hmm. So that that was the number one thing location. Um, I also wanted to be near um, uh, easy access. Yep. So, th you know, try to think through where people are, are working and how they would visit their family members. So if I if I live up north and I work downtown, well, then it would probably be a good thing for me to service somewhere in between those two things. So it makes it easy for the family members to visit regularly. Mm -hmm. That's that for me, that's, that's the biggest thing I wanted to make it not just about our residents, but about their families as well. Um, because the number one, uh, number one thing that I could think to do to enhance the life uh, of the elders under our care is to have them have a rich social life. That's mm -hmm. certainly a social life at our site, but a social life with their family members as well. And if we were on the outskirts of the city, um, it would make it just that much more difficult. Traffic in Austin is is awful and getting worse, right? And obviously, with all these people mm -hmm. moving here, so um, that that was uh, the, the second thing I was looking at. Um, Another thing that's important, I think, for for this type of thing, I, I don't want people to fall. Fall risks are huge. So I was looking for a single level house. I didn't want to have to deal with stairs. I didn't want to have to deal with putting in an elevator or a chairlift or anything like that. And also uh, trying to avoid split level, too. So anytime you'd have a step down into a living room, that's just a potential hazard. Mm -hmm. So it's you know important to look for that. Um, Size-wise, it really depends on... Um, 
uh, a variety of factors. How large of a place do you want? Do you want to service 10 people? Do you want to have 16 residents? Do you want to max it out? Um, what's a comfortable size for each bedroom and still make the house not this giant, awkward maze, too, if you're doing <laughs> sure. right, right? If you're, you know, for us, this first property was, was an existing home. We did that so that we could get a conventional loan on it, um, as opposed to finding an empty lot, which is tough in the area that we wanted to look at. Um, and, and doing a new build. Uh, I will say this though, moving forward, we're probably going to be doing new builds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, uh, remodel process has been, um, uh, fraught with challenges. So, um, uh, let's see, what else can I think of that's, that's, that's important. Is there a ratio, uh, square feet per resident that's required depending on yeah, how many e- people you're going to service? Definitely. Each state has its own requirements. Um, in the state of Texas, the minimum size for, for a bedroom is 100 square feet. That's essentially 10 by 10. Okay. Um, yeah, we've definitely tried to go over that um, as much as we could in the existing confines of the property that we bought. Um, but every state's going to have a, a, a different regulation on that. Um, so common areas don't really matter too much. It's more about the bedroom size per resident. And so like in your situation, if you wanted to uh, well, okay, yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's got common area's got to factor in there. Um, common area, no, definitely does factor. I was gonna say in, a sixteen hundred so, square yeah. foot home with, or let's say a two thousand <laughs> square foot home with uh, sixteen residents. That's just not going to work. <laughs> definitely not. Yeah, you'd be a giant grid, and you yeah have one hallway and uh, just a whole bunch of bedrooms, and you'd be you'd be very much like a hotel, which which isn't what we're trying to go right, after. Right. Um, there, yeah, there's definitely numbers of you know you multiply like if you have so many residents, you need so much common space. Okay. Um, we, you know, for us, we, we didn't have an, an, an issue of that. We've gone way over that. We have a giant living room and a sunroom and a, a big dining room and an open kitchen area that's central to, to this first property um, so that all the residents kind of will be congregating uh, in that central area. Um, it, but you are right. Um, there, are, there are definite l- regulations that you have to follow in, in each state. Um uh, for us, what this means is I, I so we're, we've actually gone for 12 residents in this first uh, site based mm-hmm. on the square footage that we could do on this property. It was just over 3,500 square feet. Okay. So as a single family home, that's a fairly large home mm-hmm. um, with that many residents. It's a medium home. Um, but we certainly were able to do a good job with our architect and minimize the amount of wasted space. So very, uh, very little wasted on hallways and things like that. Okay. Um, we have... Uh, not every resident in our place has their own um, uh, private bathroom. Some of them do, some of them don't. Some will be sharing uh, the larger bathrooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the considerations, too, is you know you have people in wheelchairs and people who will be using walkers and canes and things like that. So we've done a lot of changes to the property to I'm accommodate sure. hallways them. and doorways and everything. Right? Absolutely widen the doorways um, for, you know, roll in showers where, where, uh, you know, there's no lip that you have to step over or anything like that. Um, so it makes it much easier to do a transfer, you know, into a shower seat from a wheelchair if, if that's what you're in. Um, so yeah, lots, lots of considerations. <laughs> I, I can imagine that renovation process, um, reconfiguration process w- was a huge undertaking. And so, you know, we just mentioned a few of the items that have to be changed, right? I mean, widened hallways, widened doorways to accommodate wheelchairs and walkers and things of that nature, um, you know, roll in showers for wheelchairs. But talk to me a little bit about the economics behind your decision more than likely to build from the ground up on the second location versus um, reconfiguring the existing single family residence. So Probably if you look at the initial economics, uh, you say, okay, well, we can buy, you know, this existing home for, you know, X number of dollars per square foot. And then, you know, you set aside a budget, obviously, for the reconfiguration. And that probably looked a little bit more attractive. Um, You thought you could obviously, uh, you know, uh, save a good bit of money versus building new. Um, But maybe that's not the case now after you actually dove into a lot of things probably popped up along the way. It cost a little bit more money than you initially anticipated, even more time than you anticipated. Um, can you speak a little bit to the factors of your your decision to probably build from the ground up moving forward? Yeah, I think uh, a big one for us is um, dealing with the city on on a lot of the the changes to the residential property. So mm-hmm. even though we had the plans in place and and the permits approved and all of that, um, things like putting in a sprinkler system in a house that already exists mm-hmm. um, was not a simple. A simple sure, process. 
um, I'm still still dealing with a little bit of that. <laughs> this Trying week. to hide all the uh, all, all all the pipes and everything. I'm assuming and find a place to actually put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Getting up in an existing attic and yeah. and you know trying to you know put a whole bunch of of, of new hardware uh, in and around what already exists yeah. is just uh, it's it's a nightmare. Um, mm-hmm. uh, doable. It's absolutely doable, but it, it what it did is something like that increases the amount of time that the remodel takes. Um, and there are, in a new build, I, I can see that the process that I would want to follow of, of how, you know, B follows A, you know, on down the line, that I would be able to shorten the process in many ways because there's not a whole bunch of stuff that's already in the way. Mm-hmm. With the with the remodel, it's like the cart before the horse half the time, and you're sure. doing one thing, <laughs> and you realize, oh, I can't do that next thing that I want to do till, uh, you know, three more steps. But I, I I can't do that because they won't you know relight the gas before I do. You know, it's just the 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 time has accordioned out, <laughs> it's, and that's yeah. been the big cost because. Uh, like I said, you know, we bought in a location that's that's a, um, a well-respected neighborhood, and it, and it wasn't cheap. So my holding costs every month um, are sizable, mm-hmm. and um, the uh, <laughs> I, I yeah, just I'll say this: moving forward, um, we'll be doing we'll be doing this with investors. This first one we've been doing on our own as well. Ooh, yeah. And so there have been limitations when it comes to how much capital we want to put into this and how we're trying to, uh, you know, move things around to be able to make that work. Yep. Um, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a pricey, uh, endeavor, but it's something that we're, you know, we believe in. It's a business we really have our heart in. And so, you know, yeah, there are a lot of hurdles, but we're definitely yeah. it's a happy it's a learning process, happy. right? I mean, you're you're back in school again, and um and but you're almost about you're about to graduate, <laughs> so yeah, you pr- prove exactly. the concept and uh, move on to the next one, and uh, you know, not necessarily make mistakes, but a lot of lessons learned along the way, so that hopefully the second time around the process is a lot more efficient, quicker, and um you know, and uh, and hopefully you, you know you make more money, right? You, you save some holding costs, or you know, depending on how you're going to do it the second time around, if you're going to do a new build, construction loan are much different than just buying an existing property and actually having to pay the full debt load right out of the gate. Um, so yeah. lots of different factors to consider. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit, and I know we're, we're running out of time, but I definitely have a couple more topics I want to cover with you. And um, I could probably talk to you for a few hours about this, but I'm going to try to condense it and, and cover most of the points that I think a lot of the listeners would want to know about this investment uh, type. And uh, the, the next one I want to chat about is the actual um, the the staffing requirements of these facilities. And so we can speak more specifically to your location, which is going to have, I believe you said, was it 12 residents? Correct. Okay. Yes. What does your, what's the onsite staff going to look like there? And is, is it a 24 uh, seven type staff situation or is it um, shifts where there's no staff there whatsoever? Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. For the type of facility we're doing, it's uh, in Texas, they call it a small type B facility. So any type B facility um, you have, uh, the residents that you are taking care of in the event of a uh, evacuation, uh, a need to evacuate the place, um, they need help. And because of that, um, we need staff 24 seven. We have somebody around the clock that's there able to help them, whether it's, it's to, you know, get up and, and go to the restroom at, at night, or in the case of an event, we have somebody there that can and help them all get out of the building safely. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, uh, you know, in Texas, a type A facility actually doesn't need that. And so you wouldn't need night staff, but that's the choice that we, we made for the type of uh, care we want to give to our residents. So we'll uh, at least have to have one wake uh, staff awake at night. Um, mm-hmm. that's, that's the requirement. They can't be sleeping. <laughs> um, well, hopefully uh, prob- <laughs> not. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully not sleeping. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you utilize your staff at night to, to do, um, to take care of laundry and do some of the cleaning and, and doing prep work for the following day and some of the paperwork and things like that. That would be a way to utilize utilize their hours while mm-hmm. they're while they're there at night um and then during the day we will you know you have a um 
uh, a number of caregivers. You have an administrator. Like you said, you took the uh, administrator uh, certification course there in, in Florida. I've done the same thing here in Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I uh, we're, we're have an administrator that will be on site during during the day, during the week. Um, I won't be doing that. I'm just backup, basically. Gotcha. Um, and uh, and then a number of caregivers will also have a chef and someone doing activities, um, you know, planning activities so that they have a rich social life as well. Mm-hmm. Um, some sites uh, have uh, an on-site nurse. Um, some have a nurse on call. Um, but in the state of Texas, we actually don't legally have to have a, a nurse on staff. Um, we can, it's an odd regulation, but we can um, do medication um, supervision as opposed to administration, which is a weird gray line. Um, uh, but most places decide to have, have one at least on call, uh, right. but it's not necessary. Does that mean for medication? So you can basically kind of hand it, but you can't actually uh, administer the medication. Them. So they have to physically take it themselves. Is that what that, that is? Okay. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can hand them a little cup and they take it themselves and they're Got fine. It. Or if there was some other type of, of medicine that they were taking um, that would require um uh, you know, if you're a diabetic, for instant, okay. uh, instance, you, you know, you would have to do your own. Um, but most, like I said, most places will have a nurse that comes in periodically, if not on full-time staff. Okay, got it, got it. Now, before we run out of time, I want to get into the uh, the economic side of it, right? I wasn't going to let you off the hook without talking about some numbers here. So <laughs> okay. the first part of that would be um, more revolved around the uh, the lease-up stage, right? And, 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 and how does that look? What kind of projection do you guys have of going from, you know, obviously zero to, to full, you know, to 12 residents? And... Um, in addition to that, how are you know? How do you find those residents? I mean, is it referral based from networks or uh, you know doctors or you know other sources like that? Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So we're looking at uh, ramping from zero to to twelve for us um, over the course of uh, six months. That's two new residents per month. That that's um, pretty conservative. A, a friend of ours. Um, who has opened up a place in Dripping Springs in the last two months. Uh, it's, it's a nearby town. Um, it, he's beating those projections by far. And we're doing very similar things to, to market and get the word out um, uh, that, that we're going to be available for people. And uh, one of those is standard networking, you know, going around to the different community centers, um, churches, doctors, you know, a lot of places in, in and around our community um, just to say, hey, we're here and, and we want to be able to help. Um, we'll probably also be doing some targeted, uh, uh marketing on, on Facebook. That's something mm-hmm. that most, most of these places don't do, but, um, I have some familiarity with, uh, Facebook marketing and, and it can be powerful. Well, I mean, um, at, the, at that point, you kind of really, you're really marketing to their, um, to their kids, right? I mean, to the children. I mean, exactly yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which yeah, that age demographic is on Facebook. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, um, one of the things that Gene said in his in his course, he always says it, and it's totally, I totally am on board with it. Um, that you're 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 taking care of the of the elder, but your client is actually Uber daughter. Yep. You, you know, this one, usually there's one family member who ends up taking charge as the parents get older, who makes all of the decisions for, for, you know, the big decisions for them and helps out. She may be the primary caregiver and, and, but has a full-time job and a family and all of that, and is just totally frazzled, um, trying to do everything that, that is your, your, your target market. Mm-hmm. And so, you, you know, for us, we wanted to be able to cater not only to the residents needs and desires, but also to make the family members like uber daughter feel really comfortable in our home too right i like that <laughs> so title. you have yeah, <laughs> so you, daughter you, so you're doing this juggling act uh uh-huh. you know of, of how you're designing your home you're designing it for the resident you're designing it for uber daughter and you're designing it for your staff as well so that their workflow becomes as efficient as possible got it got it okay well we talked about the lease up uh we talked about the marketing aspect of it um Talk to me a little bit about the, and I know it's this is going to vary based on the market, you know, based on the price of an existing home, um, you know, Austin to you know Clearwater, Florida, completely different markets, completely different cost of uh, of, of property and of, of real estate. But as far as like your model, where you're at in Austin, what do you project as far as um, 
your, your total all in cost to buy an existing, and this is assuming that you, you know, with today you bought an existing property, you know, building new is going to be a completely different scenario, but, um, buying this property, the build out, you know, the reconfiguration, the build out, what are you looking at as far as all in cost uh, on this initial investment? Do you mind sharing that? You know what? I don't mind sharing that okay. actually. Um, uh, all in, we're looking at about $800,000. Okay. Um, that's a little bit under, I think what a lot of people were, were projecting that we would be able to do. Um, the bulk of that, um, certainly two thirds of that or so is, is the property itself and okay. the carrying, carrying costs. And then the rest of it is the remodel. So the, um, the property itself is in the $500,000 range. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so the, uh, you got a residential loan, which we, you, t- you talked about that a little bit, which is a very attractive component of this business because you can yeah. get a, you know, 30 year fixed, um, which is completely different than the commercial game, which we talked about a little earlier is that, you know, they can be a l- little bit more aggressive with calling notes due if the market shifts a little bit. There's always balloons in place and just lower amortization terms and just, uh, right. residential financing is much more attractive, bottom line. Um, and, but I'm assuming uh, on the flip side of that, they did not finance any any of those build out costs. And so it's probably come out of pocket. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, yeah it, it, you know, the property itself, when we purchased it, it was uh, built in 77, really solid, you know, great design. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe its last update was in the late 90s or something like that. And we had to do a lot of changes anyway. We tried to make it uh, less of a gut that it ended up being. Had, had I just gone through and just torn everything out, I think the remodel would have gone a lot faster. Um, we were, tr- you know, a couple of the re- rooms were were going to pretty much stay intact and and it still caused us problems so you know looking back i i would go in and do a, a total interior demo um just to be able to have everything open mm-hmm. to the sticks and and it yep. just it would have allowed us to do things a lot faster sure sure okay and then like in in this in the location you're building assuming that you're, you're going to stay in austin you know, moving forward and you're probably going to build very similar size facilities maybe a little bit larger next time maybe get to 16 residents but with this 12 resident facility what are you projecting once you hit stabilization? What are you looking at as far as uh, NOI projections? Do you mind sharing that? And I know I'm digging a little deep here, and you don't have to give me exacts, but I'm just I'm trying to get a rough idea of what kind of returns one might expect if they do this business right. Okay, I, I can, uh, and I've certainly talked to a number of consultants about this that have been in the industry for a long time. Um, uh, for this size of a place somewhere in this, you know, 12 to 16 range, you can look at, um, once you have your business efficiencies, uh, and your systems in place and everything's running really well, um, you can be looking at up to a 32% profit margin. And if, if, um, for Austin, uh, averages for a, a private room, uh, are about $4,800 per resident. Um, that gives you a sense of, of what, so, you know, we'll be bringing in the revenue of 60,000 or something like that per month. Mm-hmm. And that, that would at least give you a sense of what the, um, what the gross the prop, looks like, what, what the gross looks yep. like. Yeah. Got it, got yeah, it. yeah. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Well, that's, that's very exciting. And, uh, lastly, um, and, and then we'll, then we'll start working on towards, uh, wrapping up the show for the day. But lastly is I want to talk to you about your long-term plans and, um, you briefly mentioned that you, you want to build more than one. Obviously, you're not just you're not a, you're not a one off type guy with this. You want to prove the concept, um, become an, uh, you know truly an expert in the space, um, and uh, replicate this process moving forward. I know you'd mentioned something about the number ten, like you'd like to have ten facilities. But what, what do you really see as being the end game? Like number one, do you, do you plan on focusing on this niche uh, for the most part over the coming years? And then where do you see yourself in like the next five or ten years inside this niche? You know, with the real estate that you've accumulated the business that you've accumulated yeah i i am i am all in I, i'm so excited about this business Good. model i i you know for us the reason we got into this uh, you know i told you about the light bulb moment before um but there was a there was kind of a heart reason moment as well you know my my father-in-law eventually needed to go into uh, some sort of care facility we had him in one of those big places and it was awful for him and we finally found him a small place mm-hmm. uh, down in san antonio and so for us we saw the kind of the impact that we could have in individual lives and families um in a community and and so uh, this business is something that's going to over time make us a, a fair amount of money, right? We're happy about that. Uh, yeah, we do want to have 10 sites here in Austin and then we'll probably end up branching out into uh, other Texas cities like Dallas, Fort Worth and, and San Antonio too. Um, I, I, 
you know, because it's a business on top of the real estate and requires a heck of a lot of entrepreneurial spirit and focus and energy, I would be doing a disservice to to the families if I kept trying to spread myself too thin and doing too many different things. And so I, I might end up doing more passive investments mm-hmm. in, in, in other types of uh, real estate, you know, um, Sure, maybe taking your profits and, and investing in a syndication of some sort where you're yes. you know, hands off. Yep, that makes sense. Exactly. But but as far as me being an active investor, I'm I'm all in for Good. the next five, ten years. I'm I'm super excited about this because it's only gonna gonna grow from here and the the need is growing. Well that's exciting. So aside from the monetary interest that you have in this business, there's also a heartfelt interest in mission, um and which I think is very important, right? Like that's 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 really the foundation. Forget the money for a second. You've got a little bit more of a stable foundation of why you want to be in this business. It just happens that if you do it right, this business should make you wealthy. <laughs> Ab- absolutely. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I, I'll tell you this, had had that heart component not been in there, there have been moments throughout this process of, you know, finding this first property and going through this remodel and hiring staff and doing all of that. There are definite moments where had I not had my heart in it, I would have really considered giving throw, up. Throw it in the towel. <laughs> <laughs> throw it in the towel. Just like, how can I, you know, change this remodel and just get my money back out? Like that that kind of thought certainly has crossed my mind. But uh, in the end, I, you know, because I have, I have a big goal in mind and uh, trying to have an impact in the place where I live, which is not the type of career yeah. I had before that uh, that's keeping me going. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, and one last question, I promise, and I'm going to let you go for the day. <laughs> and I forgot to ask this question earlier is, is there an opportunity in a roll up strategy and actually acquiring the existing, you mentioned there was like 42, I think in the Austin Metro of this type of facility, is there an opportunity in acquiring those that, uh, maybe aren't running as as good as it could be, or you know they've kind of lost interest in the business and it's just going downhill a little bit. You know, to where there's a little bit of a distress there. Are there opportunities like that that exist. There are definite opportunities. I think just just like you have in your mobile home park investing, there might be kind of individual owner operators yep. that uh, aren't really running it all that well. They may be old themselves, right, and and are are not really running things efficiently. Um, it's the same thing in residential assisted living when this first started. Happening, happening, you know, um, you know, in the last uh, couple of decades, um, those people uh, maybe didn't have the grand vision. Uh, uh, they were just thought, oh, I can convert my home and take care of some people. That's where that opportunity would lie. And I, I, um, I've started a, a little mastermind group with other uh, owners here in Austin, and uh, one brilliant. of the yeah <laughs> one of the individuals that's that's in that group, their first home is exactly one of those that they they purchased that was already a running operation. Uh-huh. So it, there's d- definite opportunity there as well. Okay, fantastic. Well, well, I promise that was the last question. Now I'd like to enter Jason into what we call the Golden Nugget segment of the show, and this is where we're going to kind of wrap things up for the day. If you could leave our listeners with just one last piece of wisdom or advice that may inspire and help them on their path to success in a real estate investing career, what would that one last golden nugget be? Wow. Yeah, golden nuggets. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, to, to be a really successful investor, especially in this space, um, you got to recognize that that you're an entrepreneur and that means it's it's not a set it and forget it kind of opportunity it's it's uh it's got to have your heart and vision and it's going to take a heck of a lot of time up front Mm -hmm. um but eventually um if if you can if you can work through that uh, you'll get to a point where you've built something great and something that can have a huge impact um, on your life and on a lot of others' lives as yeah. well. I think I think that's uh, that's great. I mean, that, that I think that is the the importance of finding a, a business or a niche that you that you have passion for. I mean, again, it's we we're entrepreneurs. We like making money, right? We're not going to do something that there's not some kind of benefit. It doesn't have to be monetary benefit, but I think that the foundational side of it has to be a little bit more um, emotional driven. You know, to where you know you're, you're you're servicing the needs of others. You're looking to make a mm-hmm. difference in one way or another. And hopefully, you know, a an immediate result of that at some point in time should be, you know, monetary benefit as well. But I think that that cannot be the only foundation. Otherwise, I not that it's destined to fail, but I think those your competitors that actually have a little bit more of a foundational uh, approach that's attached to like emotions and in helping others are going to always um, beat you out. I mean, they're going to be a step ahead of you. 
Yeah, the last thing I want to do is, uh, you know, get to the end of all this and have a whole bunch of money sitting in the bank. What did I do that for? And, <laughs> and, feeling, and feeling hollow. Yeah, That's it. Don't want that. No, nope, no, nope, not worth it. Not worth it. Well, Jason, this has been so much fun. This is uh, um, this this was something we should have covered way back. And I know that we've been working to get on the phone together. And I'm real excited for, you know, the future, you know, what it holds for you and your business. And I know you guys are about to open up here shortly. What, what's your projection as far as when you're going to open? I mean, is it in the coming like month or two? Is it really soon? Yeah, we're looking at the uh, mid to end end of January, so super oh, soon. Awesome. We're, we're about a month away. Well, yeah. that that's fantastic. Well, Jason, thank you so much. This is, this has been just a blast having you on, and I appreciate you taking the time to share all this information with our listeners. And for those that want to learn more about Jason's company, uh, they can actually go visit him at silverleafeldercare.com. Again, silverleafeldercare.com. And Jason, that's all we have, my friend. Really appreciate you being on the show, and uh, I wish you the best success in, in all that you do, my friend. Thank you, Kevin. Congratulations! Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com and we'll see you next Monday morning.